Have you ever been watching a popular Bollywood movie and all of a sudden the plot comes to a screeching halt because the characters, usually the male ones, have inexplicably stopped off in a bar or a hall or even a brothel in some cases purely to get drunk and watch a really hot lady dance around and sing an inconsequential song for about five minutes before returning to the plot as if nothing happened? If you've ever seen a popular Bollywood movie, chances are that, yes, you've experienced this very thing. It's called an item girl song, and we're going to be taking a deep dive into what it is, how it came to be, and its lasting legacy in Bollywood cinema. I do want to start off by saying that Bollywood cinema does not account for all of South Asian cinema or even Indian cinema. There is a lot of regional film industries within India, including but not limited to Tollywood, Telugu, Tollywood, Bengali, Gollywood, and so on. So when I say Bollywood, I mean Bollywood. Those are the films I will be referencing for the most part, and I will not claim to represent anything else. I'm sure there are similar themes and trends in other regional film industries, but it would just be plain untrue for me to claim that this is true for all of Indian cinema. But now that we're talking about it, those film industries also have great films that I'd like to talk about on my channel at some point too, so don't worry about being underfed. So, what is an item girl anyway, and is it as insanely sexist as it sounds? Um, it's complicated. So first off, these girls are called item girls because an item is Mumbai slang for sexy woman. There would be no item girls without item songs or item numbers. These are song and dance sequences in a Bollywood movie that may or may not be diegetic and are characterized by being catchy, upbeat, and provocative. By the way, diegetic music means that it's music that can be heard by the characters in the film. In terms of item songs, sometimes it's a random dream sequence in a character's head, non-diegetic, or it takes place within the scope of the story so the characters can hear it, diegetic. That doesn't necessarily mean it's always relevant to the plot, however, but we'll circle back to that. These item songs came to be popularized as a way for directors to market their movies to the masses. Trailers would advertise the movies using these sexy and upbeat songs to drum up buzz before the movie's release. And these songs were referred to as item songs, and the people within them as item girls and boys respectively. Though item girls are exponentially more common than item boys, and the contexts in which either are presented vary vastly, which I will also get into later in the video. Basically, the prevalence of item songs can be rooted in marketability. By the way, while I was doing some research for this video, I found these two that are doing an actual comprehensive breakdown of item girls decade by decade. They have a whole video series on it and I watched a few and they're really interesting. So if you want to know more about the item girls themselves from each individual decade, I'll link their video below. I think it'll be a good pair to viewing after you watch this video, of course, uh, because mine is more of a rundown of the item girl as a concept. So the reason I wanted to make this video is because I actually had another video recommended to me called Guku, Bollywood's First Item Girl. It's pretty short, but also entirely in Hindi, so I'll link the video below if you do want to watch it. Um, I wanted to find some good supplemental info for English readers, but it was surprisingly hard to find information on her. I'll link what I did find and sum it up for you here. Her full name was Guku More. She was an Anglo-Indian dancer and can be considered the first popular cabaret dancer in film and thus the first item girl. She was thrust into superstardom after appearing in director Mehboob Khan's movies. One of the things she's most well known for now is mentoring the popular cabaret dancer Helen J. Dog Richardson who many claim as the actual first item girl in Bollywood cinema. It does appear to be true that Helen's star seemed to eclipse that of Gugu's after her debut as a headlining dancer, but I wouldn't be comfortable stating that as fact because there just isn't much information about Gugu's life that is readily available. What is known is that Gugu unfortunately ran into some very hard times shortly after her massive success. She experienced financial troubles, and passed away at the age of 52 from cancer. 
most of the very few sources I was able to find made a point to say that she was penniless, alone, and suffered a lot in her final days. If you know where I can find out more info about Gugu's life, please let me know because I would be super interested. So her successor, Helen J. Dog Richardson, was a chorus girl that she had mentored from the age of 13. Helen's stardom erupted after a song called, uh, actually, let me just play an interview for you. Now you listen to this uh, song, Mira Nam Chin Chin Chu. Uh, I want you to listen. Fifty, sixty years later, people remember this song and the song from Guide. What was it like? You were playing a Burmese doll. <laughs> she was looking like a doll. Chin Chin Chu, China ka guria. China ka guria. Yes. <laughs> So the song was called Mera Nam Chin Chin Chu, uh, which translates to My Name is Chin Chin Chu. Um, and I believe she was meant to be playing a dancer from Shanghai, um, a Chinese doll type character. And although Helen was part Southeast Asian, the character was clearly just an East Asian Orientalist caricature. Regarding this exotic, fetishistic, Orientalist depiction. Sharmila Sen, in her paper, The Line of Control in Contemporary Bombay Cinema, writes about the tendency to shroud the item girl in this exotified lens. Although I'm using the example of Helen playing this East Asian Orientalist caricature, Sen uses the example of Sushmita Sen in the movie Fiza. She writes, as a dancer clad in diaphanous harem pants and a veil, Sushmita Sen performs against sand dunes in a perfect articulation of what Samadha calls the near abroad. The borderland dancer is a conflation of the colonial idea of the nouch girl, the orientalist fantasy of the harem girl, and the urban Indian bourgeoisie's libidinous vision of the real folk. So that's a lot of jargon, uh, which I will concede. Um, I'll put the link to where I read her paper in the description below if you would like more context. But the basic idea is that a lot of these item girls, as we will see with the examples that I will show on screen, are typically clouded in this lens of exoticism, orientalism, and otherized in a way that almost separates them from the upper classes that are likely to be involved in the production of the film. It's almost a way of identifying yourself with an upper class that is able to look down on these working class folks from your high horse. But that's just a framework to view it through. You don't have to take it as fact. And again, I understand that was a lot of jargon to throw at you. Beyond the problematic nature of the song, the tune was catchy enough. Um, like, even I've heard it. <laughs> Uh, though Gita Dutt's vocals were phenomenal and should not be discounted, many people attributed the song's success primarily to Helen and her dancing, and she brought that elusive it factor that the film industry was looking for. This kick-started her career as Bollywood's item girl for the next few decades. Throughout the 60s and 70s, if there was a successful item song, you can bet Helen was in it. That's not to say that she didn't try to venture into the realm of acting, but this brings up another aspect of the item girl. We can't discuss the item girl without also discussing the dichotomy between the innocent maiden and the provocative vamp character, both in media at large, but Bollywood movies in particular. There are a lot of different ways to frame the two character archetypes, but for now, I'll use our favorite psychology boy, Sigmund Freud's framework. The Madonna Whore Complex, which I will be referring to as the Madonna Horse Complex because I'm monetized now and I don't want to risk it. But whereas Freud asserted that this dichotomy stemmed from a deeper psychological reason, I more subscribe to the idea that it's a social construct with a pointed goal to uphold the patriarchal systems we live in. To borrow the wording from this academic paper on the subject, the Madonna Horse Complex refers to men who perceive women's nurturance and sexuality as mutually exclusive. This dichotomy presents polarized perceptions of women in general as either good, chaste, and pure Madonnas, or as bad, promiscuous, and seductive horse, uh, horses. 
Whereas prior theories focused on unresolved sexual complexes or evolved sexual tendencies, feminist theory suggests the MWD stems from a desire to reinforce the patriarchy. This dichotomy is blatant in Bollywood movies, especially in earlier ones. When looking at the item girl and her ventures into acting roles, we can use Helen as a case study for how these roles typically went. She would never play the maiden or the innocent. Her roles always fell into the scope of temptress, vamp, and thus the evil villainous woman. Her position as item girl, no doubt, was the primary cause for this. Sharmila Sen writes, Up to the 1970s, Bollywood often relied on the figure of the vamp, a cabaret dancer, a Zavayev prostitute, a gangster's mall, to provide musical entertainment of a more sexually explicit nature. The heroine might sing and dance, but the vamp wore more revealing clothes, smoked, drank, and sang in bolder terms of sexual desire. The heroine and vamp merged into one figure from the 1980s onwards when lead actresses increasingly performed the vampy number in film. Yet the vamp does not quite disappear from the Hindi screen. In recent years, the vampy dance has been replaced by what is called the item number, performed by popular actresses, models, and beauty queens who only make a cameo appearance in the film. So the modern item girl can be seen as a natural extension of the vamp character from earlier decades of Bollywood cinema. Both were bolder, edgier, and more sexually explicit. The other side of this dichotomy, the Madonna, the innocent, and virgin, can never exist in this way, at least not in this era of Bollywood. By virtue of being the heroine, they must also be non-sexual. The vamp exists for the male lead to project their sexual desires onto, because men can express sexuality, even while their romantic interests can't. And once they get that out of their system, they can happily pursue their more innocent love, the one that's worthy of being married and having children with. Even in my favorite rom-com of all time, which I did a video on, linked up above, there's a random, completely out of place item number stuck into the end for no reason. You could say that Karina Kapoor plays the item girl in this case, reflecting an observable shift in the item girl role, but you also can't deny the abundance of scantily clad extras hanging all over Shahid Kapoor for absolutely no reason. Speaking of the shift in the item girl role, Although the item girl was historically a different role from the heroine, this has begun to change. The shift was first observable in the 1980s, as mentioned earlier, with more and more of a film's heroines also acting as the item girl. The more notable actresses responsible for the shift were Madhuri Dixit and Shri Devi. Was, and I cannot stress this enough, a cultural reset. And while I'm talking about this, I don't want to deny any other perspectives on the item girl either. I know I've talked about the Madonna horse complex, but there could be an element of empowerment in these sequences. Saranya Subramanian, a culture writer on Mirchi Play, wrote about the evolution of the item girl as she gained a prominent foothold in movies, and that although the item girl would still be dancing for the dons and drunks, she was no longer considered sexy set dressing. She could be used as a distraction or seduction and provided credibility for female sexuality in the mainstream. She writes, What's incredible is how the item girl took all the objectification that came her way only to subvert the very idea itself and gain agency over her own sexuality. The men around her are drooling over her and she laughs at their futile methods of getting to her. She isn't really dancing for the hero or the villain, but for the camera. She belongs to everyone, yet no one in particular. She's everyone's dream, everyone's desire, and therefore can become nobody's reality. She is the item girl, and she can do it all. Sing, dance, crazy gymnastics, seduce everybody before walking away by herself. And I want to say that while I think that there's truth to this statement, and there's nothing necessarily incorrect about any of this perspective, I do think it provides a narrow view of the truth. Saying that the item girl isn't dancing for the hero or the villain, but for the camera, doesn't mean much when you consider who's behind the camera and who's the intended audience sitting in front of the screens. Bringing back the example of the item number at the end of Jeb We Met, which I brought up earlier, it served next to nothing in terms of the movie's plot. 
While an end credit song to hype the audience before they go out isn't out of the ordinary, a romantic comedy doesn't necessitate a bunch of white women dressed like sexy cops from 2001. When you remember that romantic comedies are typically frequented by majority female audiences and that item songs are meant to market movies for a more desirable crowd, the reason for a song like this becomes clearer. They want to bring in a more male-centric audience for a romantic comedy that is typically targeted toward women. It all comes down to marketability. Though, you could argue that Shahid Kapoor is the item boy in the song, but he never undresses, he is never subjected to crawling body shots from the camera, he is instead surrounded by scantily clad women that fawn over him. Any similar shots for an item girl will have her surrounded by a bunch of horny drunk guys that are not sexualized or appealing at all. But allow me a quick tangent here to talk about the phenomenon of item boys. Many people would argue that a category of item boys exists, and I would agree even though they are not prevalent to the same degree as item girls are. I also would argue that they serve very different purposes, which are observable by the kinds of visuals that are paired with each type of item song. Whereas the item girls are surrounded by drunk, horny men dancing for their pleasure, the item boy is never surrounded by anything less than super hot women who are all in love with him. Also, there are rarely the kind of long and lingering camera shots on his body as there are on the item girl. If there is any nudity on his part, it's only to demonstrate how ripped he is. I argue that the item boy does not exist to fulfill any fantasy for the female viewer. It is instead a kind of power fantasy for the male viewer, someone that they can easily insert themselves into and imagine that they are the ones being fawned over by crowds of sexy women. End of tangent. By the way, my point in pointing out like the male gaze aspect of the item girl is not to say that we should get rid of the phenomenon of item girls and item songs altogether. I just think that they can be improved upon. I mean, most songs and movies, they, like they, they, they're certified bangers, like I gotta say. It's just a lot of the time, it's just very excessive and it disrupts the flow of the movie. So again, I'm not saying we need to get rid of item girls or item songs because I do like a lot of them. I just think that there are ways to improve upon them, you know? All right, cool. Thanks. So is the item girl on her way out, given that some iteration of her has been around for decades in various different ways? I think it's more likely that the item girl will continue to shift and evolve as media and the film industry progresses. The famous dancer herself, Helen, said, Of course, it has changed tremendously. In my days, it was okay if the leading lady had two left feet and couldn't dance to save her life. It's no longer the same. The leading lady must be a very good dancer even before she makes her debut in films. They must be well trained in all styles of dance. So you find today that today's top actresses are also very good dancers. But I think one thing that probably should be on its way out is the term item girl, honestly. Even director Kanakoli agrees, saying not the girls, but the tag item girl should be completely banned. Media has given birth to this phrase, and I really find it derogatory. The dancers can't be termed as an item. They are no objects, after all. A song that is supposed to be a melody number can't be termed as a number. But if you talk about these dancing divas, they will continue to rock Bollywood for a long time. So yeah, what do you guys think about the item girl? Or maybe tell me who your favorite item girl is, favorite item girl number. We really need a new name for that, honestly. Um, also comment a new name for item girls, please. <laughs> maybe just dance queens, divas, I don't know. Also, please like the video, uh, subscribe, engage with the video in some way, you know, for the, uh, for the algorithm. And also, tomorrow's my birthday, actually. I'm turning... 24 so i can officially call myself a boomer love that but yeah so for my birthday i would love if you i don't know i was gonna do the whole like and subscribe thing but you know if you're not gonna do it fine i don't need it no i, I do need it but um i'm not gonna force you i'm not gonna guilt you into it um you should want to subscribe right <laughs> anyway yeah um okay yeah bye